Uh, welcome to Treasury Elite uh, Leadership Series. I would like to thank all our viewers and members for supporting this noble cause of Treasury Elite, whose main objective is networking, knowledge sharing, and mentoring. Time and again, we bring in world-class speakers and thought leaders across the world in the field of Treasury, global financial markets, and management, and conduct various programs, webinars, and conferences in different formats. Treasury Elite Leadership Series is one such format where we learn from the industry leaders about their experience of running their businesses, opportunities and challenges they encounter, and broad trends they see for the future. Today we have Mr. Keshav Bhajanka, Executive Director at Century Ply, one of the well-known business families of West Bengal. Under his leadership, the company has ventured into various new product verticals, such as medium density, fireboard, particular uh, board, exterior grade laminates, veneers, etc., And its profits increased by four times under his leadership over the last five years. He has been instrumental in developing new eight supply chain structures and implementation of SFA and DMS technologies within the company. Keshav is actively involved with philanthropy and involved with various social organizations. He is the chairman of the Young Leaders Forum of ICC, and one of the youngest members of YPO, Kolkata, a member of Roundtable India and a member of Friends of Tribal Society. He aims to make Century Ply one of the leading top 50 companies in India. And what some people don't know about Keshav is that he loves playing cards and he's also a car enthusiast and would love to own a Phantom Rolls Royce one day. Welcome Keshav. How are you doing today? Hi, Abhishek. Thank you so much for having me. And it is a pleasure to be here. You have been, uh, I think, a little too kind with your introduction, but thank you. Glad to have you today as a part of Treasury Elite Leadership Series. In the next 35 minutes, we will love to learn from your experiences. So my first question to you, Keshav, is uh, across your career uh, over the last many years, what were the three major learnings that you uh, got from century. Um, you see, if you look at my career, my career has been a little different to what most professionals would have faced. Um, I entered into a family run business and straight from my uh, undergrad, I came back to India uh, and I was thrust into the business. Um, I think, you know, uh, what I have learned because initially it was about the rigor. I was sent out into a market. I had to sit behind a motorbike and go and visit dealers, go and visit retailers. I used to be spending about four days a week in the factory, two days in the market on that motorbike as I specified. So my first venture, the first venture that I took charge of independently was, um, was an enterprise called Nesta Furniture that we had started, which ultimately we had to shut down and that too with substantial, lo substantial losses. So I think the three major learnings that I, that I would like to emphasize is first was my father and uh, uh, his partner, Mr. Sanya Garwal, who was my boss and my mentor, both of them have told me one thing, don't be afraid to fail. So the first venture that I did independently, as I told you, it was a hefty loss making failure. But they always told me that you need to learn how to succeed. And there is no better coach than failure. So I think that is one thing that I've always, you know, taken to heart. The second thing, you know, a lot of times, there were initiatives that we tried out that did not quite pan out as expected. A lot of hits and misses. So um, my father recites this shlok from the Gita very often. It's called Karmanyava Adhikaraste Ma Faleshu Karachana Ma Karm Fal He Turbu Ma Te Sango Asto Akarmani Which means that, that you keep on doing your, your duty, you keep on doing your tasks. Don't bother about the reward. The reward is invariably going to come. So I think this is one more thing that we have been taught from a very young age. In the company, every single person is taught that we need to do our duty first and the rest will follow, success will follow. The last thing I think that I've learned is uh, there is no single transaction, you know. There is no deal which is a one-time deal. Anybody who you interact with, there is going to be a future, there is going to be an interaction, they are going to be a word of reference. So we need to be fair in our transactions and we need to treat every challenge as an opportunity. For instance, one of our customers, maybe about 25 years ago, they had an issue with the plywood. We went, we saw the issue was actually with the veneer that was based 
on the plywood, which was a competitor's veneer. But still, as they had had faith in our subsidy on renovating the entire place, that customer, it is 2020, still swears by Century Ply. I think he has bought it for his next house as well, and he has recommended it vehemently to how many other people he knew. So every challenge is an opportunity. So I, I, I think these are the three things. That, that's, that's a very, very candid answer, Keshu. I think uh, uh, the three learnings that you learned from the family, I think it very well runs in the tradition of Century Ply. I can understand that. And that's a very, very candid answer. So, uh, uh, Keshav, now you have been into business for, uh, for, for, for a pretty long time. And how do you feel that uh, companies in your industry should gear up for 2025? And what are the best practices that you would have traveled in the West and seen what possibly uh, companies in India can learn from developed uh, and matured markets like in the West? So I think there are two things, you know, everybody talks of technology, everybody talks about internet startups, et cetera, et cetera. But I think we need to get back to basics. Every single company needs to organize themselves around two thoughts. First is empowerment. Today, I cannot do everything. My father, the chairman cannot do everything. Uh, my boss, the MD cannot do everything. It is very, very simple. You need to find the right talent if you want to grow, that is. If you want to continue doing what you've been doing for the past so many decades, that does not require much effort. But if you want to grow, if you want to build, if you want to create something for the future, you need to be able to tell, to be able to delegate. You need to empower people so that they can replace you in certain tasks, the tasks that are no longer required for you to grow and scale. I think in the West, if you look at it, the processes and the systems in business are so strong. When people look at an Amazon, they think of you know, the deep pockets, they think of these people can burn money, but just look at their supply chain. They will get you material within 24 hours. If you have a problem, they'll pick back the material, they'll take back the material from you. They have such flexibility in terms of the website, the way that you can use it, your recommendations come out. There are so many times that I go and I buy something that I don't even know that I want it. So they have processes and systems in place in order to facilitate the customer in order to facilitate their business, in order to run their business. I think that is one thing that is critical for all companies in our field, in any other field also, in order to grow. So I would say empowerment and systems and processes. These are two things that we really need to, to improve on to reach the scale that we want to. That's excellent, Keshav. Uh, Keshav, uh, this is on uh, uh, financial management now. Uh, any major, and you can use an example, any major innovation or cost saving uh, measures that you have taken in terms of financial management uh, in your industry, in your company, which has given you a significant edge. It could be around commodity risk, exchange rates, financing, cash flow forecasting, maintaining your hedge ratio like you have exports, or any kind of banking group improvisations. If you could share some examples for the viewers. Um, so I, I can actually share quite a lot of examples, but I won't bore you with that many details. Uh, first, I'd just like to tell you one statement. So again, my father, the chairman, he has a statement. He says, turnover is vanity, profit is sanity, but cash is reality. So at the end of it, <laughs> manage our cash flow. For any company, that is the lifeblood. You need to make mm -hmm. sure that you don't run dry. Now, when you look at... Uh, our various product categories. In the year 1997, we brought into place a technology called thermic fluid heating. What we did is in plywood, we changed the dryer from steam to thermic fluid. That increased the productivity of the dryer by three times. So that brought about a 67% cost saving straight up. If I give you a more recent example, um, last to last year, we have set up a new plant, like you mentioned, medium density fiber board. In that plant, our glue consumption was far higher than what other competitors had. We researched, we found technology, and we brought in a blue jet six, uh, system. Uh, I won't bore you with the details, but it's basically a system by which we reduce our glue consumption by 25%. That is a straight away 3% EBITDA increase in my, in my product category. So we keep on innovating, we keep on thinking, we try to learn from the best practices of competition. And I think this is one way where, you know, you keep trying to improve by learning and looking at the examples of others or looking at your own processes. I think it's a mixture of both. With regards to Forex, three years ago, our Forex liability was around $50 million. 
To date, is less than twenty million dollars. The reason for this is because we felt that there's going to be a huge fluctuation in forex for a sustained period of time. Even today, we have about a twenty million, which is completely unhedged. The reason we have kept it unhedged is because we don't believe that there is going to be a very big um, sort of change in the next few months. We feel the worst is behind us. But again, all of these are very subjective uh, thoughts. This is a policy that has favored us in the long term. As such, we are leaving it open. But I don't think I can tell you with full conviction that this is the right policy or the wrong policy. That only time will tell. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so, Keshav, uh, for some thoughts on management, are you a left brain leader or a right brain leader, and how do you keep a balance between head, hand, and heart? So um, I think you know I can tell you uh, tell you about both of these together. You see what happens is I have modeled my entire career over looking at two people, my father uh, and uh, my boss, Mr. Sanjay Agarwal. So both of them have been partners, and they started a company in the year 1986. What I realized over the course of time was one of them is meticulous. For him, it is process, process, process. So Mr. Agarwal focuses only on process. on defining how work should be done for him it is meticulous number crunching and making sure that you are on top of every little facet now if i look at my father he is quite different for him the gut feel is very important for him it is about understanding trends and planning for something that is 20 years later so it is not about today it is not about what is going on but it is about looking and visualizing at what things are likely to be so i think it is a combination of both left brain and right brain that has influenced me my ideology isn't based on either one side i think i take after both but yes um if there is a 50 50 decision there i would more likely than not take a decision and move forward as opposed to not take that decision so i think i may be a little a little right leaning that's awesome that's a lovely combination you got in the family and in the business and i think that's one of the reasons why we have seen success with century ply i think it's extremely important to have a balance between both uh please share one of your most extreme life changing experience and how your professional and personal life evolved post that was it a big personal or company financial loss that you took to succumb to a family or personal health emergency a relationship fallacy anything that jolted you and made you push the reset button so um like i told you when i took charge of nesta which was the first venture that i independently handled um i was very optimistic i thought i could turn the business around the business was making losses even before i joined it before i took charge but i was fully convinced i could turn it around but over the course of the next 2 years i realized that this venture considering the the eco space considering the ecosystem considering the the online e-commerce presence considering a lot of factors there isn't really much money to be made here so you know very scared i went to my father and to the md uh, to mr agarwal and i said that this is this is the situation and i think that you know in the past two years our losses have, were more than 10 crores so i was literally shivering it was it was a nightmare to be able to to you know have to go up to them and say that i don't think there's a future here because you always feel that if there's a loss for the sake of a business growing in the future that is acceptable right but if the business has no future it's a sunk loss it's it's something you have to write off right and i was almost shivering as nervous as hell and what i heard and i expected to you know hear harsh words etc beta hota hai agar fail nahi karoge to sikhoge kaise you given it your best we have seen how much effort you put in now you need to put that effort in somewhere else and they handed over the decorative division of the business to me at that point in time if it had gone the other way i think that i may have never recovered but it was the support it was the confidence of these individuals that told me that it's okay it's okay to fail you don't have to have to be afraid to fail if you fail but if you put in your best there is always another avenue you are going to be able to do something else so i think that was a very big a big changing point in my life mm, that's awesome back to financial loss turned into a great opportunity and confidence 
in you. And this is where the attitude of seniors and mentors come into play, Keshav. Amazing. Uh, how do you maintain a spirit of competitiveness without combativeness and aggression in your organization? How do you bring consistency on how the organization acts and things? And how do you ensure culture does not get isolated in the corner office? So those are three very big points on their own. But let me get to the first one. Uh, you know, when you speak about competitiveness, there has to be one, one thing. Within the company also, there's a lot of competition. Manufacturing will always be competing with sales, saying that, you know, manufacturing will feel that we are producing more, they can't sell it. Sales will say they can't produce what we, what we want. So again, process and system. So in the last few years, we have brought in a consultant called Vector Consultants. And while they have not been very successful in some parts of the business, in the supply chain part, one thing that they have done is they have isolated sales from manufacturing. Now the supply chain takes care of the interim part. So it is not that manufacturing is producing for a sale that's happening tomorrow. They are producing for a stock, for a stock that is being placed strategically in the factory, which is not under the control of the factory. And that material, the replenishment is being defined by the supply chain mechanism. So we were able to eradicate that entire conflict between sales and manufacturing through a process change. So I think processes need to be defined very clearly in order to, you know, to make sure that there is no negative over competition within the company. Let's put it like that. When it comes to being competitive against, against the competitors in the market, you see, we always pride ourselves on being able to learn from what others are doing well. So whenever we see a best practice and we have our product management groups, which, which focus on market research, on what is going on, on product categories other than our own also. So whenever we see competition is doing something well, we try to understand how and we try to improve ourselves further. If we are doing well in something, we continuously try to innovate and see how we can further improve it by a percentage, 1%, 0.5%. So I think that is how we have built the organization to be extremely competitive. And I think the culture that you're talking about, the culture is driven straight from the top. You know, you have to preach what you teach. So the chairman of Century Plywoods India Limited never flies business class. He will only fly economy. That is the culture that we wanted to put through in the organization. When you look at, uh, well, uh, let's look at quality. Every single person from the chairman to the MD to ground below, if they receive a complaint from an individual customer, that complaint will be addressed. That is the emphasis that we place on quality. I'm talking about a quality complaint, scheme, discount, etc. All of that is uh, handled by the team. But if there's a quality complaint, it goes all the way to the top of the company. Now look at it. Every person below knows that if this problem is not adhered to, this is going to go to the highest level. So I think this entire culture needs to be driven down right from the top. If you want your team to be putting in 10 hours a day, then you have to put in 12 hours a day. So I think that is what we have been able to do successfully. And I think that's why the culture has, has you know, percolated. Right, right. That's amazing. So Keshav, uh, tell me more about you as a person and what are your three rituals for the day and what is the best career advice? Of course, you mentioned about what you learned from your father and your uncle, but what is the one best career advice that you received? So my three rituals, uh, well, I walk for 10 kilometers every day. It helps me keep my mind fresh, you know, and I've realized one thing that when you work out, when you, when you do any form of exercise, whether you walk, whether you do yoga, my father does yoga for two hours every day. It just brings about a little bit more freshness in me. I think, I think it, it's something like you mentioned, I like playing cards. So every day, me, my wife and my parents, we play cards for order hour every single day in the evening without fail. And uh, the third is no matter what happens, I will spend one hour in the day. Whenever I'm in the city with my daughter, I either play something with her, I read some books with her. So my daughter's three years old. She's very young. So right now, you know, for her, mama and papa are the most important in any case. So those are the three rituals that I think I practice. Best career advice, there is one thing in business for which there is no substitute. It is hard work. At the end of it, no matter how smart you are, no matter what your IQ is, if you do not put in the hours, you will not get the result. So don't be scared to put in the hours. You need to spend enough time at the right, at the right task. It is not about just working. 
every person in the world works, but it's about working smart. So I think hard work and working smart will take you to a point that you want to achieve. Otherwise, uh, it's tough. Sure, sure. Give me a fun fact about you, which we don't know so far, apart from uh, cards and cars. So I am a football buff. I support Manchester United, and um, you know I am I I wake up even at two thirty a.m. for the matches. When they have European matches, I wake up at twelve thirty, see the match at two thirty, and go back to sleep. So I am addicted to to football, and I watch every single game. They have about sixty games in a year. I don't miss a single one. Um, I think that's one. Second, um, well, uh, I'm a car enthusiast, like you just said. I think these would be two two fun facts. Yeah, I read about you where the, the Great Ocean Drive on an E-class. Of course, I had the same experience uh, three years back with family, oh, uh, which which was a convertible work uh, on the Ocean Drive, and it was one of the finest drives even I had, apart from the drive between San Francisco to LA. I think that was an awesome experience. Something soothing, huh? It's just something yeah. like about the yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. So as a as a uh, as a skill set, uh, so of course you talked about a lot of learnings that you had within the firm. What what advice would you give to uh, uh, similar professionals uh, 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 of your age in the industry? That how they should be investing their time, like you said about right focus and making sure your tasks are well aligned and you put the right energy the right amount of time what is one advice that you would give to other professionals who are of your age in the industry and my second question is when you are hiring someone what do you look what do you look at one top quality that you look when you are hiring someone um the one thing that you know i think anybody my age group or even a little older maybe will need to look at is Uh, don't think that you're right. Don't be afraid to to get criticism. So, my team, my immediate team under me, a second line, they argue with me on every point. Once we come to a conclusion, they try to convince me. Now, I try to listen to them and to take take the best course of action. Once a decision is made, there is no discussion around. The decision is final. It needs to be implemented. But till that point, they can argue, discuss with me. to any extent possible maybe out of 10 times six times they convince me not to do what i was thinking of doing earlier maybe four times they are not convinced but i will still push it through so today you need to to be able to to take criticism you need to you can't think you're always right you need to know that there are flaws and the reason that you're hiring people under you is because they are better at that job than you are if you don't give them the opportunity to prove it then there's no point in hiring them in the first place so be open to criticism and uh, take your team's inputs take the, the the correct person should take the correct decision or should influence the correct decision take the decision but hear all sides before you take that decision and what was your second question sorry yeah what is that one quality that you look while hiring someone clarity the one quality that i look at is clarity today when you ask a question somebody can beat around the bush and give you five essays or they can tell you the same in one one line somebody who has that clarity of thought somebody who can explain himself and who knows it's not just what explaining the person could be wrong could, could take half an hour to explain them but the the clarity of thought needs to be then the action they took so i think that is the single most important point i look for uh, when i'm hiring someone great great keshav it was it was a lovely interview with you and with that clarity of thought i would say that normally when i take this interviews with people it stretches up to 35 40 minutes we completed this in 26 minutes and that's because of the clarity of thought that you had across all the questions that i asked otherwise sometimes i see people just extending it very very long so i think it was a very very uh, candid honest and a well structured call wish you all the very best uh, the entire bhajanka family and uh, the agarwal family Uh, a very very uh, 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 successful careers ahead a very very uh, good future for the company may century ply thrive with your under your leadership and may all your colleagues your friends your family everybody stay safe in this uh, uh, very interesting times of covid i wish you all the very best and thanks for taking out time